Rates are another version of taxation, a property tax used to pay for the services provided to that property. And over the past months, all of the local authorities throughout the island have been working out what money they will need to raise by the rates to pay for the services they provide for their communities in the next 12 months. The scale and scope of these services vary considerably from one authority to another, although all of them have some issues in common. Rates also pay for burial grounds provided by church wardens and water and sewage services provided by the Manx Utilities Authority. But once agreed by the Board of the Commissioners, or the Douglas Town Council, the rate for 218.19 is announced. Some have increased the charges, others have frozen them for another year. There is a widely had view that rates are an outdated and iniquitous method of taxation that takes no account of the ability to pay, the amount of people living in the property and the method of assessment, which is based on an unusual valuation of the property. Well, rates were an issue in 1900. That was the year when the Douglas Town Hall in Ridgeway Street was opened. And there's been decade upon decade of debate about what to do and what alternative systems of raising money should be used. But as yet, no significant change to the system has come about. Douglas is the island's largest local authority responsible for a wide range of services. It's a multi-million pound organisation. And on Wednesday this week, the leader of the council presented the budget for 2018-19 and the annual review, and also the chair of the housing committee gave a separate review of the housing budget. Douglas is the biggest public housing authority. An increase in the rate by 2.7% to 419 p in the pound was agreed. So what do we get for our money? Do we need 22 separate organisations in the island, all raising their own rates? And how relevant are they? is the system of bureaucracy in today's digital age? And what is the relationship of local government with central government? And of course, what will the year ahead hold at a local government level? Well, to discuss this, and I'm sure much more, and to take a look at the work through the eyes of the Douglas Borough Council, we welcome our studio guests. Councillor David Christian, MBE JP. He's the council leader and chair of the executive committee. And with him is Councillor Claire Wells. She's in the chair of the housing committee. Well, both of you, thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. And thank yeah. you for being here, David. Yeah, it doesn't sit. It, it was a year ago we were here doing this, the it last is, time yes, you realised. Yes, yes. <laughs> It's been an eventful year, would you say? Um, certainly, it's been a challenging year. Um, I mean, we, we review our budgets throughout the course of the whole year. That's at committee level and also at our management team levels. They will review the budgets a couple of times a month, mainly to make sure we're staying within budget, but also constantly looking to see where savings can be made. And we've, we've had one or two challenges through the course of the year that have had to be addressed. And then as we start to get towards this time of the new year, um, the budget started coming together, I think, in October last year when the, the first round of them comes before a committee. So you'll have fees and charges delivered to all the working committees in October. And the officer's recommendation will normally be that all fees and charges go up by the rate of inflation. Now, I can assure everybody, all the members scrutinise those. And if there's no increase in a particular charge to the authority, then we do not pass an increase on. In the month of um, November, they have all the capital programme coming forward. And these are the various different schemes the committee will have looked at through the year and possibly previous years because we have a five-year plan within the council for investment. So the committees will start getting the reports. They'll have to decide whether they want to run with it that year. Is it affordable? And they will then put that forward to the executive committee. And then December is the revenue one. That's the one where, of course, we determine everything that's going to operate throughout the year, all the services, the level of service we can provide. Can we afford it? Do we need to reduce services? And we try to determine the level of rate. What total sum of money are we talking about? What's the bottom line? In revenue new budget we we bring in about 11.3 million pounds is the money that comes the, in through, the to through, total overall yes, budget for the, the rate what? the total overall budget's about 30 million pounds if you look at all the relevant capital schemes mm -hmm. as well and a, a lot of that though i have to say is obviously based within housing yes. because we have major schemes like the williston one which i'm sure claire will talk about going on at the moment so that is a a, a large sum of money so the, the source of the money then that we're talking about here when you talk your revenue money is this 
basically from rents, and or, or do you get subsidies from government? Do you have commercial in, an input? The the revenue that we get coming in that is just the, that is the rate collection, and obviously we do still have a number of commercial properties around the town. We we they have diminished in recent years. We have sold some of them on because particularly where we had houses that we were letting out on the commercial market, um, I, I'd had the view for a number of years. I didn't really think that was the job of a local authority to be competing with a private landlord on a commercial rent mm. basis. You know, we have a big enough headache and then, well, Claire has a big enough headache dealing with our social housing issues. So we have over the, the last five or six years disposed of a number of properties and that money then comes into the capital receipts fund and that money is then used on other new schemes that may come forward so that it doesn't have an initial impact on the rates. Well, how long have you been doing this now, David? <coughs> um, last last November, um, the 2nd of November last year, was 30 years since I first stood for the council. Oh, yeah. So uh, I've done actually 29 years because I took one year out. I became very disgruntled. I think it was 94, 95, and with certain shenanigans that were going on at the time down there, and myself and John Christian sort of led a little bit of a revolt, and we were the alternative council, and I decided to step down. Um, I went straight into the next council meeting and sat in the public gallery and within two or three months I'm thinking to myself, you can't do anything sitting here, mm. you need to be there. Mm. So the next month we used to have annual elections and one member used to retire by rotation in each ward and uh, the next year I went to the, the, the candidate who was in at the time, who was a very good councillor, Peter Warrener, and said I'm throwing my hat back in the ring again, it's for the seat, it's not personal. And at the last minute, Peter decided not to stand, and I went back in again. So, right. and I've been there ever since. Been there ever right. Okay. Well, of course, it's a general election every four years now, isn't it? It it is, and it's strange, really, because I was a big supporter of going for the general election because I genuinely felt that would have had more candidates coming out of the woodwork. This having an election every year, and for Douglas's case, one retiring by rotation in the six wards. There wasn't enough people coming forward and, and people were turning around saying, well, your meetings are during the day. Well, they're during the day because of the level of officers that we have coming in. If you had them coming in at night time, there'd be considerable cost. So we actually tried, we changed, we put all our meetings into the evenings. It, it didn't bring any more people out of the woodwork. People didn't come forward. You're, you're either interested in politics or you're not. So when it was put forward in 2008 to have a, a local authority general election, I thought this has got to be the way forward. But it has to be said, we, we haven't seen the numbers coming forward across the It was supposed to be some sort of razzmatazz, wasn't it? They thought it created increased interest. There'd be a bit of a buzz about it. It, it was, and, and give the various departments the, the credit as well. They've tried to promote it as well as local authorities, mm. but it still hasn't had that, that effect. We've still had uncontested elections, not just in Douglas, but around, around the island as but well. There's another issue there, isn't there? Uh, of course, the question is why. Yes. And, and maybe we might come to some of that later. How long have you been a councillor now, Claire? I'm coming up to my fourth year now, um, which is astounding, really. I can't. It's um, it's just flown by. Um, I kind of landed on, in council by accident, if I'm perfectly honest with you. Um, there was a by-election, and um, I was asked to put my name forward. It, it's not something that I've ever really been, you know, taken much note of, if I'm absolutely honest. But it, and it's been a very steep <clears> learning curve for me. I've been very lucky with the people who are surrounding me. They're very helpful. And um, I've really enjoyed every minute of it. And I think if somebody told me today that I have to not do it anymore, um, I think I'd be quite upset about that, if I'm well, honest. I really enjoy it. It's good. Yeah. David's heard me say this many times. Politics is addictive. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Get it. Well, look, let's, let's go through just some of the various things. Claire, I'd like to go through your... You, you gave a separate budget address for mm -hmm. the housing, and maybe we should deal with some of the elements in that in a moment. But David's, which um, I said uh, to you before we started our programme today, that it was fairly long, and you <laughs> said, well, it's not as long as last year's. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but but I mean, it, l reading it, David, it was it was detailed. Uh, but uh, looking at it, I have to say um, that I wondered about the meat in it. Very upbeat. I would expect you to be. You wouldn't yep. expect you had in need to inspire confidence. I understand that. But it was um, no doom and gloom, of course. But I got a little worried that there was a crossover with the government's ideas, and I'm not too sure how you're going to deliver all that. Well, I, I think mainly because the council is working more closely with the government than it has done for, for many years. And in your introduction, Roger, you said that's probably one of the subjects we will touch on. Mm. But we do work more closely together. I mean, I've been on Douglas Regeneration Committee now for a number of years, invited by the then Chief Minister Alan Bell. I was on the Central Master Plan Committee, and people will know the glossy brochure that come out with some very adventurous schemes in it. And um, One of those schemes is actually in the budget this year that we are 
are going to try and deliver on as a partnership with government and the private sector. But the speech was upbeat. Um, I normally start my speech um, towards the end of November, beginning of December, and I'll come up with a load of themes. I look at the previous year's speech. This year's was 27 A4 pages, and it was um, live on Facebook, and a few people um, who have actually contacted me since and said they sat there much, and they found it very, very interesting. They didn't, re didn't realise what the local authority was actually involved in. They had a bit of a surprise there, but they said, how can you stand for so long? I said, well, last year was 45 pages. So I, I was determined I was not going to make that mistake again. It was upbeat, but I'm, I'm one of those local authority members that I'm afraid, yes, we know there's issues out there, but I'm not going to talk our town and our island down. We've got enough people doing that. Open up any part of social media and the doom and gloom merchants mm. are there constantly. No matter how positive you are and how yeah. good something's coming out, the doom and gloom is there. So I have tried to be positive through it and I've tried to encourage all members to be positive. Posi being positive is great and there's nothing wrong with that. But of course the key to being positive is delivering. It is. And the whole of the budget speech was about investment this year. I don't know how many times I said investment through all those pages, but it, it is there many, many times because the council is investing. It's investing to save for the future. And that's something we've done now for at least the last 10 years. We've started to, uh, we've basically now renewed all our infrastructure that we're responsible buildings wise because lots of them were becoming liabilities they really were so there's been a lot of investment in that area this budget again demonstrates the investment we're making in our public um, sector lighting around the borough where that's two and a half million pounds um, uh, sorry one and a half million pounds of investment we're making but over the 15 year period of the new lights it's going to save nearly 2.7 million pounds that's energy cost maintenance that's on current electricity holds. prices yeah. it, it is but that's the sort of project projections we're hoping to make so I mean that that is a, a big financial saving that we are planning for and then we've got other investment in public amenities for example in this year's budget for a long time people have been calling for new um, toilets over on the Queen's Promenade that once you get past the, the boating pool, you've got nothing till Strathallan. This year, we've, we've taken it by the, the, the bull by the horns and the old underground toilets, which have not been in use for 15, 20 years. Mm. And they, they flooded for a long time, and that was mainly after the Iris works were done along the promenade, so we closed them. But that's how long it has taken the council to determine to put new toilets there. There's an investment of over £100,000 in new public conveniences. And the one thing I am proud that the council has done this year is we are still going forward with leisure facilities because it is all about betterment of life. It's about listening to people. And the surveys we've done over the, the, the last few years, people have been very vocal on leisure facilities. Well, you say, and it appears in your speech more than once, and I'm quoting from page two, it's about attracting inward investment. What's that? What are you trying to attract? Right. Well, the inward investment, and it is actually coming in now. If you look at the regeneration works that have taken place in Strand Street through the main shopping area, which was very hard for the traders down there to deal with, and, and for the people coming into shop in the town, and we did see a dip in the footfall figures during that period yeah. because people just stayed away. Um, but the, the whole of Strand Street has now been regenerated. We've seen Castle Street is now underway, due for completion mm. in September. But, uh, where's the money coming from? But, but this inward investment? No, the inward investment has come from new businesses which are investing in the town. And you've only got to look at the investment that's now taken place in the Strand Shopping Centre. A major investment, that was getting to the stage mm. where we thought it was going to close and wasn't going to be there. But the one that really sticks in my mind is JD Sports. In the press release they put out, they said they've actually decided to invest in Douglas because they've seen the investment being put in the infrastructure. Yeah. Of course, when somebody like that comes along, and you're talking now about breathing life back into a shopping centre, and it has been a very long time, Strand Street, and yeah. um, one form or another, and shops come and shops go. But uh, the problem, of course, with attracting very large organisations like that is that whilst they come and do what you're hoping them to do, they tend to knock out of the frame the smaller local businesses. Th there is always the danger of that, and, and I think that's just the way town centres have evolved. But I would certainly like to see that investment in the town centre rather than the outskirts of the town centre, which uh, we had a conversation just before we come on, Roger. Mm. That has happened across in many towns, and it's killed the town. So whilst there will be a few casualties along the way, these bigger shops coming in and people turn and say, oh, well, it's just the same now as a UK street. and that. But that's what the people want. You know, they're either buying it online from these big firms, now they can go down to Strand Street and get it. So that's got to be a plus because they're paying taxes, they're paying national insurance, they're employing people, and it's taken up an empty unit in the, in the shopping centre. So that's win-win all round. 
It's a balancing act, isn't it? It's 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 a balancing act of bringing the big companies across, but allowing the um, the smaller companies to also be there. Because if you've got the big companies in town, it brings people into town, which will then buy from the smaller companies. And if the smaller companies are providing a good service, and you know, if you can walk <coughs> into them and and you've got the friendly face and the people you know, you'll buy from them. Whereas if you don't have the big places in town, people are are going to choose the internet instead, and they don't get the opportunity to walk into town and see the local buyers. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, though, Claire, there is a, yes, indeed, what you said there, but there's another issue. Smaller businesses, and I know a bit about smaller businesses, I've got one, tend not to be in the major town centre because there's two reasons. They can't afford to be there. I mean, a lot of these town centres uh, in Douglas now is owned by uh, companies and people off Ireland who do know how to, well, they charge their rents, don't they, mm. quite heavily. Yeah. Uh, and they give us a major headache. Mm. I mean, we've had instances in the past where one shop in particular lay empty for over three years yeah. because they would just not reduce that rent. There was people interested in it, but they said no because once we come down to that lower level, it's going to take us years to get back to where we are now. So they rather just they lay Lose empty the for, for over three years. And that was a big store. It, it, it's, it's let now. So we are pleased about that. But the absentee landlords, that does does definitely give us a problem. But if you look around, Douglas, and you've just said, Roger, you're, you're a, well, I was going to say a small company, but if you look at the amount of work that you turn mm-hmm. out, particularly the election time, <laughs> I think you must do most of the manifestos on the island. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, you've been an employer there for, what, 40 years. 40 years, mm. constantly. You know, you're just you're only on the outskirts of the, the main shopping area, really. You're only just a prospect hill. It's not that mm. far, really. And you get a lot of pass and trade there. But we've still got a lot of independent small businesses in Douglas. And mm. over in Castle Street, they're nearly all small independent ones. So that's why we're really pleased the, How the do retail you assess works then, um, Claire, you, you talked about it before. How do you assess the footfall that comes in? What what method do you use to know who's coming in and out of the streets? We, we've got, it's a camera. It's, yeah, it's we've a got camera. cameras on um, outside the um, shop prior to the coming in that side and on um, Duke Street? Yeah, there's one at yep. um, uh, Regent Street, Regent Street by sorry. Marks and Spencers. So we pick up all the footfall <laughs> there and then we've got another camera over by the Strand Shopping Centre which picks up the footfall mm. and that one there has been valuable because the council introduced some schemes for Chester Street Car Park. We all know it's nobody's favourite car park. Yeah. Low ceilings, lots of pillars. It's dangerous to get out of it. Yeah, very narrow spaces. Very narrow spaces, you know, we, yeah. we are aware of that and we, we, we do de- have different ideas to try and improve that car park because we run it on behalf of government. But it's been very valuable for us looking at those figures because we do three after three in that car park <laughs> and we've yeah, it's not easy <laughs> <to say>. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been tongue tied several times um, but th- those figures have actually proved the number of people coming in picking children up from school after three o'clock and coming down and using mm. that car park free of charge mm. now they're not just coming to town for a coffee mm. they are coming down and spending and on a Saturday the usage of that car park has gone up considerably because we made it two pound for the day and again we're able to catch these figures on that camera coming in of the benefit Obviously, you've got Sports Direct there as well. The strange thing was we had a dip at the Regent Street one, and we couldn't work out why, because we were talking to the retailers, and they were saying, well, your figures are not matching ours. We're holding up well in the town centre. So how have you got these figures? And you know what happened? Regent Street Post Office had closed down and gone to the middle of Strand Street. Mm -hmm. So people were coming in from Howard Street, Granville Street, not Regent Street and Duke Street. And that was the dip in the figures, so they were still in the town centre, but not coming through where our camera was. Yeah, you know, it was strange because the retailer said, don't you be publishing those figures? We're actually doing reasonably well in the town. Well, all of this, of course, all of these town centres, you say that uh, you're trying to attract businesses to stay in the town centre, but there's a development. Some of your other fellow local authorities, for instance, have got in their territories a lot of retail business on the Bratton particularly um, on the outskirts and I think they're rather keen to have more Mm -hmm. so you've got a conflict of interest there haven't you? Yeah I think I think it's very worrying actually because I think um it's going to take. It has already taken a lot of business out from the centre of Douglas, and it's going to kill our town centre if we allow it to carry on. And I think there was. Well, what a, can you do about it? Well, there was great concern raised when we had the East Region Plan was put forward, um, and we put th- forward our ideas, and we just said, look, you know, we can't continue down this route because we're just not going to have a town centre, which will kill local businesses as well as you know, everything else that comes with that. So. Um, it, it's just trying to encourage people to make sure that they stay in the town centre and make it available for people and making it a nice place to go and I think we've worked really hard to make sure that is and there's the two developments which are happening now on either side of the of the street to bring it all together into one you know Mm. continuous flow is going to help that and also Claire's right Roger the eastern plan that's going to be something we're going to play a major part in because it's been out of consultation they've just announced another 20 or 30 sites that have been added by individuals and of course these are just suggestions people are putting forward but that plan will eventually go before 
uh, an independent inspector and there'll be an inquiry where everybody can come forward and give their evidence. The council will be putting forward a very strong case because we cannot continue to see the development that we're seeing on the Cool Road and 70 odd hectares of land up there developed. Yes, we're all human. Wouldn't we all love to pull a car up outside a, a big retail store and that and park there and straight in and your stuff in? But the people that want that are the same people that will go mad when the town centre is dead. Mm. And that's what will happen if that's allowed to happen. Um, even the office developments that have moved up there, and don't get me wrong, we can understand why they've gone. New buildings, I mean, one of them in particular, their energy costs have dropped by 100,000 because they've got an energy efficient building from where they've moved from a year. That's a big savings, and we understand it. But the impact of those two or 300 people not coming into the town centre at lunchtime whether it's just to go to a cafe, get lunch or whatever. But the other thing we're starting to notice is they're not in the town centre on a Friday evening. So come five o'clock where they'd go down and pubs and that would benefit, they're not there, they're out of town. So, oh, I'm not going to go into town, I've got to get a car, parking space, I can't leave it at work, I'll go home. Well, you're not going to stop, are you? If, if the planning people permit it, you're not going to stop the Bratton Commissioners or whoever doing this because, of course, it's good revenue for them as it, well. It is. It, it's got to be through the Eastern Plan. We've got to control it. And government have really got to, to, to sit up here and take notice of what's happened across. And we can all drive around different, different towns and cities in the UK and see the desperate desperate decline but in some areas you're seeing some of that now starting to close down on the outskirts and get back into the town centre. Well not necessarily they're closing down sometimes because the internet's taken over. Well certainly and it's it's a big problem for us on the island. You can't get you can't get away from that but I think it's also I think for us we've raised the concern and we have made our, our points very clear to the government when we consulted on the east region plan and it's now it's in their hands it's in their gift to do something about that and to make sure that it doesn't happen we we can't stop it there's you know it would be unrealistic to stop it because we can't it's not in our powers but it is in the planning power and they need to make sure that they ensure that our town centre is preserved one of the problems david with doing this type of program for as long as i have you get a tremendous sense of deja vu yes <laughs> yes <laughs> how many plans have we seen that have whizzed around and mm. had consultations and everybody's prattled on about them and they've come to naught. Numerous. I mean, the, the Eastern Plan definitely will, because obviously the current Eastern Plan that we're all working to is years out of date. So this is happening. This will go to an inspector and a planning inquiry later on in the year. So this will happen. But this is going to, to mould what will happen in the East. And it's Douglas, it's Braddon, it's the Onken area. It's, that will mould what's going to happen for the next 15, 20 years. So, you know, it's important that we do all have a say and we all get this right. Because some of the proposals that came forward when they went out for um, expressions of interest or ideas for where areas people would like to be developed certainly left a lot to be desired. Well, there's one other thing that we must move on now to another subject because we because this is this is actually quite an important one in in many ways. But it's, if you go around the Strand Street area and the hinterland of the Strand Street area, back to the days of my youth, people lived in the street. Yes. Now mm -hmm. uh, I, I would think there's hardly anybody, if anybody, lives in the street no. these days, and the shops therefore used to service them as well. Yeah. It was a whole different animal of shops. And you said in your speech, um, a place, a desirable place to live work and visit yeah but live is one of the words you've got in there yeah m most certainly but i don't necessarily mean within the main shop and corridor i mean there's lots of people that feel and it is a corridor let's face it at the end of the day it can be windy it can be wet there's not a lot you can do over the years we talked about it years ago roger about roofing over strand yeah, well, street there's a lot of problems there oh there? desperate i mean hundreds of different people you'd be dealing with it would never ever happen <laughs> and it hasn't mm. happened um but it's a it's a windy tunnel is our, our shopping area um, so that makes it very, very difficult. The shops have developed over the years, so there's no separate access now. But if you look above a lot of the shops, they're lying empty. Yes. It could be accommodation, but the way they've now been redeveloped, there's no separate access to get people upstairs. So I think where I'm talking about to, to, to live in particular is any of the other larger developments that may come just outside of the main town centre, uh, of the main shopping area. So we've got big vacant sites. We all know them. They're all lying there. Let's incorporate some accommodation in those. Well, we're talking about vacant sites because we're, we're hedge hopping a bit here at the moment, but it does come to mind. What about the what, the town square or whatever you want to call it? I call it the old villiers site. I mean, that is, to, to forgive the cliche, it's a blot on the landscape, isn't it? it? It most certainly is. It's been a very difficult site for the council because when it was bought all those years ago and the villiers hotels came down, I mean, we'd had running battles with the, the state of the villiers and the, that, that, that block for nearly 10 years. Then it was demolished. We got what's there now, phase one. And phase two was developed, but phase three, four and five have never, ever come. When phase five was going to be completed, 
the town square would be the building site and then we'd have this new super duper town square in the centre because it's never happened mm. but to be honest with you looking at it it would be the wrong place my idea if you're going to have a decent town square it needs to be in the centre of the shopping area so really those shops that you see in Duke Street coming into Regent Street the ideal solution if we all had plenty of money would be to move those out to the front of the Villiers site and create your town square right in the middle of but, the shopping area but who would do that well that's the trouble that would have that would have to be a mixture of public and private money because obviously all those shops are privately owned mm -hmm. and a couple of them were bought up by a developer with that in mind but trying to deal with the 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 owners on the Villiers site over a number of years it has not been easy well do you not have powers to say look this is the gateway to the island this is giving them all a person get off the boat yeah. It's giving them a bad impression. Do something about it. We've we've served notice on on the owners through their agents and basic remedial works are done. Unfortunately, our legislation is not the strongest when it comes to that on the island. But so the basic works will be done, and within twelve months, it's looking shabby again. Unfortunately, but we we all sing from the same hymn sheet in relation to the Villiers site. If we had a magic wand. It's, it's, it, we'd love to see something happen, but it's not just there. We've got several vacant sites around Lower Douglas and, you know, it is the entrance to our island and it doesn't make a good image. One problem you often find is when you live with something for a long time, you accept it, you get used to it, it's, it, you, every, it's a day-to-day -day thing. And it takes somebody else, it happened to me recently when we had some visitors who came in and said, it, I like Douglas, but some of it could do with a lick of paint. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, well, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do, people do take it for granted, I mean, I think I said last time when I was up here, and we've had conversations about this, Claire, about the regeneration works, and you'll hear the odd moan about the key area. And I always say to people, just remember what it was before it was regenerated. Right. We, we we forget very, very quickly what was there. What were you talking about, about clinches in your speech? Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've spoken to the, the owner of that site, and I've seen some exciting plans from the uh, clinches tower, down to the um, Alamo Breweries pub that's there, so the old coaster site and all right, that, yeah. of a really, really exciting development. And I know they've had long discussions with planners, and if it can happen, that will be the rejuvenation for the key. It's that a we, likely development, we, is it? It most certainly is. Yeah. A lot of time and effort's gone into it, and I, I, I just pray that planners and everybody else will get behind that developer, and we'll actually see that happen, mm. because it'll be a real shot in the arm for the area, but it'll be a shot in the arm for the nighttime trade as well. And we are losing out because people are, are going home, they're buying drink cheaper in a supermarket and staying in. That has the effect of hitting the restaurants, closing well, down drink pubs. Drink driving as well. Drink driving. Um, taxis, because people aren't coming out, so the number of taxis available at night time has dropped. It has a real serious knock-on effect that lots of people don't really pick up on. Yeah, I don't know about drinking at home is a good idea either sometimes, <laughs> but you know, drink about no. it. You know. <laughs> now, I, I, Claire, I'd like to deal with the housing thing. We'll come to it if we may after the break, because we need to go to one shortly and deal with it separately. But j just to finish off this part, there's some all sorts of things that are in, in you know, I'm, I'm hopping a bit in, in your um, report, uh, David. One of them, he says, is I'm pleased to announce that from tomorrow, that was this was last Wednesday, all of the council's permanent workforce will be paid at least the living wage. Yeah. That implies two things, that they were being underpaid before. <laughs> well, they're on the pay structure that's under the piece, mm -hmm. pe PSC, Public Service Commission. Used to be the old Whitley Council. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, since that's come in, it's made it very, very difficult under the new grading structure for all local authorities, not just Douglas, to recruit. We had major problems last summer. We just can't recruit people under that the, under the new system. not been paid enough. Yeah, the, the, the whole grading, so it's just too mm -hmm. low now at coming in level. So we couldn't get people. We've actually got 18 people. Um, who are below the living wage. So it is a cost of £25,000, but we feel that the government has indicated that they want people up to the living wage and not the minimum wage, and we felt as a responsible local authority to help with retention of staff, we'll bring these, these 18 people up. We could have waited until the 1st of April and because... I presume these are relatively unskilled tasks, are they? Y Yes, they are, they are. And it doesn't include our apprentices because they're under a different scheme mm -hmm. altogether. We've got seven apprentices at the moment. Really, this should have waited till the 1st of April, but we have made um, considerable savings in the manpower budget during the, the, the course of the last year through vacant posts, so we decided to implement it with effect straight the after United the United Kingdom's main chamber of commerce reckons that if too much living wage is enforced, the jobs will go to robots. Yeah. And and you know they've got a valid point. I mean, I, I, I'm I, I'm self-employed. I employ a, a, a few people in my small business. And to be honest with you, I've always paid above the minimum wage. But with the level of contracts that I've got in my business, to to jump to the living wage, I'd be lucky to survive. Right. 
Well, now, we'll come back to all the various other things uh, in a moment, as I said, we've been hopping about, but I would like, uh, Claire, to talk to you about housing because it's mm-hmm. a fundamental part of the Council's it budget, is, yeah. so much so that you presented it as a separate report. So we'll deal with that after the break. In this week, when many of the local authorities have announced their rate for the forthcoming year, our studio guests are Councillor David Christian, the leader of the Douglas Borough Council, and the chair of the Executive Committee, and Councillor Claire Wells, who is the chair of the Housing Committee. Well, uh, Claire, that Housing Committee, looking at your report, seems that it was a fairly large task. You seem to have quite a lot on your plate there. What's the overall budget for housing at, in, in, the, um, in the Council? Um. I haven't got the exact figure for the overall budget, um, but I can say that we collect over eleven million pounds of rent nice. on a, you know, on, yeah. on the year, and we've actually got a really good ninety nine point seven percent sort of income on that, which I think is very very good. Um, our officers work very hard to get that in, and we use every single penny that we can that we get in from it. Yes, but and you also mentioned in your report that one hundred and thirty eight new families were housed this yep. year. Now, That's is right, that yep. is that actually old properties just with new tenants going in them, or yes. those are new properties as well? No, we haven't got any new properties at the moment. Um, I have some lovely plans which I'd love to to bring forward, but um, at the moment that is just kind of turnover at the moment and getting void properties um, up to a, a standard for living in. Yeah. Well, how do you fund that? And uh, David is talking about the capital budgets earlier on, mm-hmm. and I assume that housing must be a significant part of the council's capital budget. Yep. So uh, now, now this won't come out of revenue, will it? It'll have to come out of borrowings, I presume. So for capital schemes, do yep, we have to borrow for them, and we have to go to the DOI to get um, permission to do that, um, which is always a battle, um, and it's one that um, is tedious to be perfectly honest because we have a, a very good um, workforce that put our plans and our business case forward to the DOI who then either accept it or reject it or trim it down or, or do whatever they do which is a very frustrating process when you're looking at a lot of um, older properties that are in desperate need of um, a breath of fresh air is probably the best way to put that they, they really need a They're lot tired, of investment they? Yeah. they are very tired you mm. know a lot of them need need a lot of work doing on them but it's this battle between um, the government to the DOI and ourselves to try and get the right schemes in place and I think um, what I spoke about in council was the fact that we'd taken a, a big step back from just throwing schemes in to, to fix a, a, the top layer of the problem and we'd taken a, a step back to look at everything and look very carefully at what we were doing to make sure that when we put a business case forward for a capital scheme for example, the Spring Valley one is probably the, the, the best example that I can use. Instead of just going in and saying, right, we're going to do this part of it, so we're just going to do the lintels, which is the big thing at that moment, we took a step and said, well, actually, while we're in there, what else can we do? What can we fix? Can we do the paths? Can we do the exterior? Can we check you know, various different things? And it's about putting that case forward and fighting for it as well. I kind of feel we do. We always have to fight for what we put forward to say, look, we need to do this once and do it right because yes it's a lot of money and the government do have to pick up on the deficiency on that and I understand that they, that's why they scrutinise things but it's about looking to the future and making sure that what we put in now lasts because I think there are times having I mean we spoke earlier on about the fact I've only been in for four years I've only been doing this for two but when I look back at what's been done I kind of think well why didn't you just do this while you were there why didn't you the williston scheme is a, is a brilliant one you know why aren't didn't you do the paths and fences while you were doing this big scheme and that's because we are trimmed down by the doi and they say well you can't do it all but the right thing to do is to do it all and it's about pushing to make sure we do the right thing and doing the job properly and that's what we're trying to achieve. Well, there was, of course, you have to, I think we have to accept that throughout the last few years there's been a, a mindset within government of austerity because mm-hmm. of the various circumstances. So the moment you mention money, there's a quivering in the Treasury. Yeah, they, yeah they, they, totally. They, but nevertheless, you, you, the, you, through your report, Claire, I noticed mm-hmm. that you referred frequently to the DOI, <clears throat> not see things as the DOI is one of your phrases. Yep. And this is probably what you're talking about. You also talk about the financial constraints Supposed upon you. What are those? Yep. So we only get a certain amount of the rental income that we are allowed to use to reinvest within our property. So we only get um, a certain amount for our management fees, a certain amount for our um, the fixing up of of um, of houses, and 
we're only allowed to use very small amounts and the amounts that we're given, the percentage that we're given, just don't cover what we need them to cover. The management allowance is only 5.5%, which doesn't cover the management of the large amount of properties that we have. So, um, so yeah, we are constrained with what we have. We did go back to them this year again. We did change, we did change our approach to the DOI this year because normally we would just say we want this percentage and we need this for our budget, you know. Whereas we said actually within the next five years, this is what we would like to see, so that in five years we're at the point where it is funding itself and we haven't got a big call on the rates on our, on the Douglas Council rates and on the deficiency. The deficiency will go up and down. We, that's understandable because if if rates for our loans go up, then that will increase our deficiency. Um, if we put more capital mm-hmm. schemes forward, which we're going to have to do because we have to invest, then that will also go up. But um, we are very restricted in, in how much money we are allowed to use. Our maintenance well, budget well, is very small. You mentioned this percentage. I have a figure in my <coughs> mind of just over 25%. For the maintenance, I think, yeah. and and if that is the case, what happens to the other seventy five percent? So it goes into using our and paying off our, our loans, so our capital loans um, yeah. and the loans that we have on our property still. So you're servicing capital and interest there. Yeah. Yeah, oh, but the, but the rest of it, right? So the and you say there's a there's a sort of subsidy comes out at the end if the if the figures don't tie up. That's right. So um, we go. There's a it's a very complicated calculation that the DOI put in front of us. It's our deficiency calculation, and it is a complicated one. It's one that doesn't really work very well for us, and um, we have gone back to them on a number of occasions to say, look, this just doesn't work. And what you're hoping, so in simple terms, what is supposed to happen is you're, you're given a budget, and when you get to the end of that budget, and there is an there's an excess of money that you need the government are supposed to pay that out of the deficiency, but it just doesn't work that way. So we're allowed a certain amount of voids um, and various different thing, allowances that we get. But if that, in simple terms, the government are then supposed to pay the overflow, but they don't. So if we our management fees cost more than 5.5%, we have to go to the council and say, look, you know, we, we need right. some extra money here. Um, our legal fees this year were hugely over budget. So we had to go cap in hand to our executive committee and say look you know our legal fees are now this much can you help <clears> us um top that up which which is a good thing to do because at the end of the day you know we're getting income but it costs us money so if we're trying to um to get um rent out of people then we need to go down that route and and make sure that everything is and um, does one size on. fit all david does this sort of regulations is it would be the same for bride and for peel and for ports over the over the years they have tried to change it now so that we are all in line there's a pointing system for allocation of houses for exist uh, for example which is across the island mm. and the way that the money's dished out to the the authorities is basically the same but obviously Claire and her committee have got some big problems out there and there's other big problems just around the corner if you look at lord street Mm-hmm. James We're Street. Talking about the flats. The flats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. James Street, King Street, um, Westmoreland Road. They're very old. They, they are very old properties, and I know that Clare and her committee are starting to focus on that, saying, right, what are we going to do? Because there's large numbers of people living there, and they want to live in the town centre. They don't want to go up on the outskirts of Anacre and places like that. Mm-hmm. They they don't have mm-hmm. cars and this that type of thing. But they also like to lodge. It's a difficult site to redevelop, mm-hmm. but that's got to happen. But also within housing. They're tackling the largest local authority housing estate on the island, Williston. 730 properties over for a refurb, 35, 40 million pounds worth of work. And a problem which has um, come to light now, well, it's been building for a number of years and Claire's trying to deal with this. We've got a chronic condensation problem in lots of our properties. Yep. And that's because we've insulated the properties as requested with yeah. cavity wall insulations, yeah. new doors, new windows, the fires taken out, yeah. um, no loft air, insulation. No air movement. No air movement. Mm. And now we've got chronic, so because everybody's ringing us on a daily well, basis, black my house is a damp. Mm. So we've done a report, we had a report done, 26 individual properties of all different shapes and sizes have been investigated. They've come forward. Every one of them states it's down to the way the tenant. And, but people are still living in r- these. Yes, running the house. Mm. And you're also going to have to do a number of works, like putting extraction systems in. So that's going to be a major capital yeah. scheme that Claire's got well, to let's, grips with. Well, let's just take all these properties for a minute because there's all shapes and sizes. I always thought the Lord Street Flats, for instance, were sort of a, a community within a community down there. They seem to be in, in that sense over, the, over all the years. But... Nevertheless, you've got all these properties in various states of some good, some bad, some are different in states of repair. Who owns them all? Uh, Douglas Borough Council do. You do? We own them, yep. Mm. So we have to look after them and they are our responsibility. And it's um, 
But it's you, a big responsibility. So you, you, you own them all, yet the yep. government tells you you can only have 25% yes. of your revenue yep. to, to repair them. Isn't yeah. it mental? Yes, that's be- totally be- true. Because yeah. we signed up to the deficiency payment agreement many years ago. Um, if we didn't have the deficiency payments, the council would have to set its own rents. Now, the chances are our tenants would be paying then considerably more. The value of our housing stock at the moment is £235 million. Pounds. That's the value of the How housing stock. How do you get stock. that value? Well, the <laughs> professionals have been brought in and they, they valued the houses at that. The big but, brains. But there are still £75 million worth of loans that are being repaid now, as well. Now, this is the other issue. Not, uh, you haven't said it to me, but I've had this said to me by people from other authorities who feel a bit aggrieved about the way they have to borrow as well. They say they can't go out to a bank and hackle and get a good rate. Right. They've got to go through a government system and they probably pay more. Yeah, this changed a number yeah. of years ago. It was with the Alamann Bank, and when that mm. contract comes to an end, it's now with HSBC mm. for a shorter period. Right. So we are tied in. You recall many years ago, Roger, we used to issue bonds. Yes. And people used to feel they were investing in their town, and that was the money we used. We paid more in an interest rate, but people got more out of it. Yeah. They knew their money was safe, and they felt they were helping the town. Um, that came to an end a number of years ago. I think it's underwritten by the government, though, isn't it? The loans are, the loans which is are, where yes. the deficiency grant comes in. Yeah. So we have to go through them um, because they they are our underwriters, basically. Now, if you're going to put people into these houses, and now you, you've got all the different levels of, of houses, people go in at one time, and then a few years later their fortunes change, and they get maybe younger people get get on, and they get better jobs, earn more money and so on. Uh, you refer to, I think twice in your report, Claire, to means testing. What was the yep. purpose of that? Well, I think means testing is still very important for us. I think um, there is a, we've, we've started on our five-year tenancies and we're coming up to the end of those. Um, I think it's the end of this year is the, the start of our five-year end of tenancies. And that was supposed to bring in the idea that when you get a council house, it's not a house for life. You know, it's supposed to help you on your way to buying a property. Well, a lot and, of people thought it that way. And I, th- and I think it's a change in culture. And I think that's what the government were intending to do by bringing in these five-year tenancies. And mm. I think it's the right thing to do because it's not... It's suppo- a council house is supposed to help those who are in need. And when their fortunes change, they are then to move on and, and get themselves up and running in life. And that's what it's supposed to be. And means testing was promised by the Isle of Man government, I'm thinking about six years, seven years ago now. And it's just never been brought in. And I think that's because it's a beast, really, to be honest with you. And there's a, I think there's a misconception that there are hundreds of people living in council houses who, um, who can afford to be elsewhere. And I think while there may be some, I don't think it is as big an issue as what people perceive it to be. And once... I think the government started looking at means testing and how they were going to tackle it. I actually think it was going to cost them an awful lot more because actually people were going to need more support than what they were getting as opposed to finding a lot of people out there who were on higher wages that could be living in the private sector. And I think that's possibly, I'm not guaranteeing that, it's just my it's just my opinion. That's why it hasn't come in. But I think it is really important because there are people there on the opposite side of the scale who do need more help and are in need of assistance. And I think it wasn't in this year's speech, but it was last year, where I said the, the funding for public housing should be coming from one place. It shouldn't be coming from... At the moment, it comes from our um, our council rates, it comes from people's income, and it comes from social services, deficiency. It should all be coming from one place. If somebody is not in a position to pay rent, they should be getting the money through social services. And we sh- shouldn't be getting involved in that at all. So they should be paying from one side. And then we should be able to run our housing service without any you know cap in hand to government saying we don't have enough money to do this we should just be able to do it through the rent the rent should be at a level that the houses look after themselves we have enough for management we Mm. have enough for maintenance that it should be an easy (coughs) equation to make but unfortunately because it's been a long time coming that the the rents have been a lot lower than they should be and really it should have been stepped many many years ago and i think um from the the stories that I've heard from Douglas, they have been going to the government saying, you need to raise the rents, and people were reluctant to do that. And that's why we're in the position we are today, because investment hasn't been done you know, as the years go by. They've just been left, and now we're in a position where huge investment is needed rather than a small amount. Right, now we're right at the end of the programme, folks. Um, may I ask, are you going to join me on the Manor Line at quarter past one? Will yeah, we continue with this? Yes, yes. And maybe our listeners might like to join us. Yes, then certainly, yes, yes. Well, thank you. 
Well, there we are then. Uh, I spoke for you there, Claire. Is that all right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let, let's hope some of the keyboard warriors come and ask us questions. <laughs> In the week that the Douglas Borough Council has announced its rate for the forthcoming financial year, we've been discussing just some of the work of the corporation, the system of raising money by levying a rate and what the money's used for, future demands and requirements, and we haven't got round to it yet, but maybe the changing role of local authorities and the relationship with government in general. Yeah. Our studio guests have been the leader of the council, David Christian, MBE, and the chair of the housing committee, Claire Wells. Now both, as you just heard, have agreed to join us once more on today's Man in Line, that's Manx Radio's Sunday phone-in programme, that starts at quarter past one today after the news, weather and sport. So this is your opportunity to join in the conversation, tell us about something that's of interest to you, or ask a question. You may have a different subject even you'd like to talk about. Whatever, you would be most welcome. Call us by telephoning 66 13 68. You may also text to 166 177 or email to studio at manxradio.com. The programme was produced by Catherine Nicholl. I'm Roger Watterson and we all look forward to your company again at 150. <laughs>